Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, tonight's webinar. We're just waiting for a few more registrants to join, and we'll be starting in about one minute. Hello, good evening, everybody. My name is Dr. Mira Helman Ostrov. I'm a gynecologic oncologist at Hackensack University Medical Center and the Secretary on JOMA's Board of Directors. I'd like to introduce tonight the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association and the Women's Health Initiative Series. The Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association, also known as JOMA, is a non for profit organization whose membership includes Jewish Orthodox female physicians and trainees with the goal of providing evidence-based preventative health and women's health education and patient advocacy to the Jewish Orthodox community. Tonight, we will cover an overview of topics related to women's reproductive health. We'd like to thank our generous sponsors, without which this event would not be possible. JScreen, Sherman Abram Labs, the Jewish Fertility Foundation, Extend Fertility, and Turo College. Thank you for being partners with us in promoting women's health education. Next, I would like to introduce one of our sponsors, Dr. Edward Halpern. Dr. Halpern is a pediatric radiation oncologist and the chancellor and CEO of New York Medical College and provost for, uh, I'm sorry, provost for biomedical affairs at Toro College and University Systems, as well as professor of radiation oncology, pediatrics, and history. To be honest, his accomplishments are too great to list here. I will now hand this over to Dr. Halpern. Thank you and good evening, everyone. As one of the sponsors of your program, may I offer you readings from New York Medical College and the Turo College and University System. New York Medical College was founded in 1860 and merged with the Turo College and University System in 2011. New York Medical College has on its Westchester, New York campus, a school of medicine offering the MD degree and the MS in bioethics degree with an optional major in Jewish medical ethics. A school of dental medicine offering the DDS degree, a graduate school granting the MS degree in clinical laboratory medicine, basic biomedical sciences, and a professional MS for those seeking careers in industry along with standard MS and PhD programs in the basic biomedical sciences. There's also a School of Health Science and Practice, which grants the doctoral degrees in physical therapy and public health, master's degree in speech language pathology, public health and biostatistics, and a nursing school for individuals with an RN seeking a BS degree. Turo, at our campuses in New York, Nevada, and California, also has four DO programs, two pharmacy schools, and our newest partner, the New York College of Podiatric Medicine, which is joining the Turo College and University System. All of our academic programs have academic calendars based on the Jewish calendar, so that our students never have to worry about academic requirements bumping up against religious observance. Our cafeterias are all OU supervised with an on-site mashkiach. We offer regular programming with Shirim Daily Minions and Yom HaShoah programming. We are proud to be a health science university under Orthodox Jewish auspices. We also offer what I am sure is the largest inventory of Sherma Shabbos medical and dental residency programs in North America. I wish the organization great success in your deliberations this evening and assure you that New York Medical College and Turo are pleased to partner with you in your efforts. Have a good conference and thanks for allowing us to join with you in this effort.
Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Thank Halper. You. Thank uh, you, Dr. Halper. I, uh, I, my video appears to be frozen, so I apologize if it appears so on the screen. But I would now like to introduce our moderator for the evening, Dr. Sharon Stoll. Great, thank you, Mira. And thank you so much, Dr. Halpern, for joining us and for the sponsorship. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. I see our attendance is growing by the second. So thank you, everyone who, who is joining us now. Uh, my name is Dr. Sharon Stoll. I'm a neurologist at Yale School of Medicine in Connecticut. And before we begin, I would like to inform you that we will have a question and answer session after all the speakers are finished speaking. All questions should be posted in the question box. If you would like your questions to remain anonymous, please hit the remain anonymous button. Uh, there will be no option to post in the chat box. Also, you will notice that every person viewing this webinar is anonymous. You cannot see that other attendants are in this webinar. So your preference here is completely or your presence here, I'm sorry, is completely anonymous and your video and voice cannot be enabled. Again, we ask that all of you, um, when posting questions, if you would like to remain anonymous to the panelists, please click the remain anonymous button. I would now like to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Tirza Spiegel Strauss. Dr. Strauss completed her ob residency at North Shore LIJ and joins the ob faculty at Wayne State University. She is now completing her subspecialty training in maternal fetal medicine, also known as high risk OB, um, obstetrics at Mount Sinai. And um, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Sharon. Give me a moment to share my screen. Sure. Good evening, everyone. Tonight I'll be talking about pregnancy and the window of opportunity to improve maternal health. I have no financial disclosures and this lecture does not constitute personal medical advice and should not supplement for seeing your physician. Tonight we'll be talking about pregnancy, infertility and miscarriages and terminations. My talk tonight includes a systematic and comprehensive review of the journey of pregnancy with a special focus on preconception health, pregnancy screening, and postpartum health. I will discuss the best screening practices and why they are important for both maternal and fetal benefit and review risks of common obstetric conditions that can affect any woman. I will review delivery, its timing and modes, as well as the trial of labor after cesarean delivery, and I will discuss postpartum health and the lessons we can apply to future pregnancies and lifelong maternal health. Preconception health refers to the time period prior to becoming pregnant. Why is this time period important? Firstly, 45% of pregnancies in the United States are unplanned, and therefore women are often unexpectedly pregnant, which may affect their health, their future child's health in multiple ways. Pregnancy is the body's natural stress test and maternal health also affects fetal health. During pregnancy, your heart rate and stroke volume increase, causing cardiac output to increase, which is further stress on your heart. Many medical conditions, such as diabetes, hypertension, and inflammatory bowel disease can worsen in pregnancy, especially if they are not under control before conception. This can negatively affect both mother and fetus and can result in a number of different adverse outcomes. For example, women with autoimmune diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease and lupus have the best outcomes if they have no flares for six months prior to conception. Many medical conditions require multidisciplinary care between specialists. It is important to see your OBGYN, your medical specialist, and your maternal fetal medicine specialist that is a high-risk pregnancy doctor so that you and your team can plan how to obtain the best outcomes for you and your future child. Another reason to see a doctor is if you are considering becoming pregnant is to review your pregnancy history. Preconception visits are also important for those who have had a premature baby, a baby with a birth defect, a miscarriage, or a stillbirth. Some of these adverse outcomes may require diagnostic testing, and these tests may provide answers and possible interventions for the next pregnancy. 
It is also very important to stay up to date with your routine screening, such as pap smears and dental visits and vaccinations to prevent adverse outcomes in pregnancy, such as cancer diagnoses, preterm birth and maternal and fetal infections. Some studies show a link between gum disease and having a premature or low birth weight baby. Many women also develop new medical problems since their last pregnancy, and therefore preconception visits are important for women with no medical history as well. One of the largest demographics of pregnant women are women of advanced maternal age, that is women over 35. Women over 40 also have higher rates of maternal morbidity and mortality, and therefore it is vital to make sure your screening is up to date for mammograms, for diabetes, et cetera. Now that we've discussed how to optimize maternal health before conception, let's discuss how to improve fetal health. I'd like to draw your attention to what's in green over here from three to six. From the moment conception occurs, the embryo undergoes division and cellular differentiation to form different organs of the body. And by the time pregnancy is realized, it may be too late to change things. The best example of this is the fetal neural tube, which is formed by six weeks of pregnancy. Every woman who is not using reliable contraception or any woman who is considering pregnancy should be taking folic acid one month prior to conception to prevent neural tube defects such as spina bifida. Additionally, certain medical conditions such as uncontrolled diabetes can affect fetal growth and organ development and therefore it is important to have these conditions under control before attempting pregnancy for optimal maternal and fetal outcomes. During a preconception visit, your doctor will review the prescribed and over-the-counter medicines you take. Certain medicines are teratogenic, which means they can cause fetal anomalies. And you should always discuss plans to switch these medicines with your doctors before you are pregnant because there are often safer alternatives in pregnancy. It is not a good idea to stop your medicines without discussing this with your doctor. Some examples of such medicine include acne medicines, anti-convulsants, blood pressure medicines, or mood medications. Along with optimizing health outcomes, preconception health includes discussing your and your partner's family history of genetic disorders and medical diseases that relate to pregnancy and lifelong health. If your OBGYN sees that certain health conditions run in your family, she may recommend that you see a genetic counselor. This is a person who is trained to help you understand about genes, birth defects, and other medical conditions that run in families and how they can affect your health and your baby's health. Carrier screening is recommended for everyone prior to conception to, term, to determine if you are a carrier of a genetic disease that can be passed to your children. There are multiple different genetic panels that SD Rose discussed last night. I'm just gonna mention that at the very least, testing for diseases such as cystic fibrosis, spinal muscular atrophy, hemoglobin diseases, and fragile X, along with spe ethnicity specific panels are now recommended for everyone by the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologist. Expanded carrier screening, which is the test for all the recessive diseases can also be chosen by many women, given that most women's ethnicity is mixed and many people will be carriers for at least one disease. I'd also like to mention that for women over 35, there is an increased risk of having a child with a chromosomal abnormality, and there may be a link between men over the age of 40 and the risk of genetic disorders. Once you are pregnant, it is important to see your OBGYN in your first trimester. Some adverse outcomes in a previous pregnancy may be preventable or modifiable with early screening and or interventions. Some examples include a history of a preterm birth where a cerclage or a stitch in the cervix may be indicated. With a previous history of preeclampsia, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, aspirin may be indicated to start at 12 weeks. There are many other indications to start aspirin to prevent preeclampsia in your pregnancy, and this should be discussed with your doctor. An early screen for gestational diabetes is recommended for those with a history of gestational diabetes and those who have other risks as well. In your first trimester, genetic screening is recommended for all women. This determines who is at high risk for having a child with trisomy 21, which is also known as Down syndrome, as well as trisomy 13 and trisomy 18. This is important because Down syndrome occurs one in every 700 live births. Having this information earlier rather than later can help women decide how to manage their pregnancies and if continuing pregnancy will help them obtain the best care for their baby as many babies will have additional medical needs requiring a higher level of care from the moment of birth. 
A first trimester screen consists of a nuchal translucency, that is an ultrasound measuring the back of the baby's neck, along with serum blood levels of certain analytes. It may consist of a blood test called a cell-free DNA. It depends on the institution where you get your prenatal care. If carrier screening has not been done, it can also be done at this point. Now that we've discussed genetic screening in pregnancy, we'll review genetic diagnostic tests. I'd like to turn your attention to the right image where you see chorionic villi sampling. This is a sampling of the placental tissue in the first trimester. I'd like to now draw your attention to the image to the left in amniocentesis, which is a sampling of the amniotic fluid in the second trimester. Both have similar risk profiles and are used to answer a question about a diagnosis for the baby. This is often done for women who are at high risk of carrying a fetus with genetic disorders, such as having a test result that comes back at high risk, or women who carry the same recessive genetic disorder as their partners and therefore have a one in 25 chance of the fetus carrying this disease, women who have an ultrasound which shows fetal abnormalities, women who have a history of a child with a genetic disorder, women who are of advanced maternal age with an increased risk of having a child with chromosomal abnormalities. And the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists recommends offering both screening and diagnostic testing to all patients after a discussion of the risks and benefits. Given the personal nature of prenatal decision, this can be discussed further with your doctor and genetic counselor if you're interested in diagnostic tests. Another important visit in your pregnancy is for the ultrasound. The anatomy ultrasound around 20 weeks is recommended for every single pregnant woman and many other women require additional ultrasounds during their pregnancy. Some women decline ultrasounds because they think it will not change anything in their pregnancy. However, having this information can help prepare you, your family, and the pregnancy team for the best outcomes for you and your baby and even be life saving. An ultrasound can detect potential life-threatening emergencies in every trimester, such as an ectopic pregnancy, which is a pregnancy outside the uterus and incompatible with life. An ultrasound can also diagnose twin pregnancies and determine if the twins share a placenta, which can change management throughout the pregnancy. Ultrasounds can detect placental issues, such as placenta previa or accreta, which we will discuss soon, which can affect the timing of your delivery, the mode of delivery, and the hospital, which you will deliver that for the safest outcome for you and your baby. Ultrasounds can detect fetal abnormalities, which may allow you to see a high-risk doctor or deliver at certain centers to have better pediatric teams for better outcomes. And lastly, ultrasound can also detect a short cervix, which increases a woman's risk for preterm birth. And you can be given progesterone to help prevent preterm birth. Immunizations are also part of the prenatal visits. Flu is recommended from, the flu vaccination is recommended from September to May, and the Tdad vaccine is given at 28 to 32 weeks each pregnancy. This is beneficial for the mother and the baby in three ways. A mother is less likely to get sick, and we know that mortality for pregnant women is quite high with flu. The mother passes the antibodies to her baby through the placenta, and the highest rate of antibodies passing is actually at 28 to 32 weeks, which is why we do the Tdad vaccine then each pregnancy. And a mother is less likely to get the whooping cough or flu after the baby is born, and therefore less likely to transmit it to her baby. Vaccines which contain what we call a live virus, such as measles, mumps, rubella, varicella, or HPV, can be given postpartum. But ideally, women should be up to date on their vaccines before pregnancy. I would like to discuss some obstetric conditions now. The first condition I'd like to discuss is gestational diabetes. The placenta produces human placental lactogen, which is a hormone that causes insulin resistance, and that is why 7% of pregnancies are complicated by any type of diabetes. We screen for gestational diabetes at 24 to 28 weeks because controlling diabetes allows for better and safer maternal and fetal outcomes in pregnancy. Due to the physiology of pregnancy, blood pressure may increase after 20 weeks, which is called gestational hypertension. Your blood pressure is taken during every doctor's visit in pregnancy in order to screen for gestational hypertension. Women who are diagnosed with gestational hypertension are at higher risk for developing a disease called preeclampsia. Severe preeclampsia is a pregnancy associated condition with high blood pressure and signs or symptoms of damage to the body's organs that is diagnosed with abnormal blood tests 
or symptoms and requires delivery by 34 weeks or sometimes earlier, depending on maternal stability. If you have high blood pressure and or experience visual changes, headaches that do not resolve with Tylenol, right upper quadrant pain by your liver or shortness of breath, these are reasons to be evaluated urgently by your doctor. Preeclampsia complicates two to 8% of pregnancies globally and 16% of maternal deaths are attributed to hypertensive disorders. Preeclampsia often also happens to women who have had no risks during their pregnancy. I wanna give a shout out to the placenta now, which is the baby's meal plan. Oxygen and nutrients pass from mom to baby through the placenta. To the left, you see a placenta after the baby is born. And to the right, you see a diagram of the placenta and how it passes oxygen and nutrients to your baby. Sometimes there can be issues with your placenta. The first condition I'd like to discuss is placenta previa, which is when the placenta is located directly over the cervix instead of your baby. If you turn to this left image, you can see a diagram of this. This may cause bleeding in pregnancy and requires a C-section at 37 weeks. To the right, you can see a picture of placenta accreta. This is when the placenta grows too deeply into the uterine wall and potentially other abdominal structures. A placenta accreta requires a hysterectomy, which is a surgical removal of the uterus at the time of C-section around 34 weeks in order to prevent maternal hemorrhage and maternal death. The instance of placenta accreta has risen to three in every 1,000 pregnancies, and one of the biggest risk factors is a previous uterine scar. We've talked about obstetrics and placental abnormalities, and I'd like to give space here to acknowledge those who have suffered any sort of fetal loss. Every loss is a loss, and my heart goes out to women and their partners who are suffering. First trimester losses will be discussed later this evening. I'd like to spend some time talking about a stillbirth or an intrauterine fetal demise, which is generally a demise after 20 weeks of pregnancy and occurs one in every 160 deliveries. There are multiple causes for stillbirth, including infection, fetal growth restriction, structural abnormalities, <coughs> genetic causes, placental abruption, obstetric conditions, and hypertensive disease. There are many tests that can be done to determine the cause of stillbirths in the hope of preventing this in the future. <coughs> Support during this time period is critical and will be discussed during our December series. It is also important to see a high-risk doctor for a consult after a loss to discuss what can be done in the future in the hopes of preventing a further loss. Many conditions that are maternal, fetal, or obstetric require frequent monitoring for safety of mother and baby. Always ask, always ask questions about your diagnosis, make a plan with your OBGYN and MFM, and discuss your goals of care. Many conditions have also been shown to have better maternal outcomes and decreased rates of stillbirth when babies are delivered earlier, and therefore induction is indicated at different gestational ages for different maternal and fetal conditions. And induction is when your labor is induced. This does not mean a C-section. Induction in many scenarios has actually been shown to increase rates of vaginal delivery in many populations as opposed to awaiting labor. There are trials of women with gestational hypertension at 37 weeks who are induced and had lower rates of C-sections. In 2018, a very big study called the ARRIVE trial was performed in hospitals all over the United States and showed an increased rate of vaginal delivery at 39 weeks for women who were low risk. These women chose to be induced at, or were um, randomized to be induced at 39 weeks instead of awaiting labor to occur spontaneously before 41 weeks. In this study, the women had lower rates of cesarean birth compared to the group that awaited labor before 41 weeks. They had lower rates of hypertensive disorders such as preeclampsia and gestational hypertension and their newborns in the induction group required less respiratory support. If you do wish to await spontaneous labor and it is safe to do so, induction is recommended by 41 weeks for low risk women as this is when the rates of stillbirth increase. For women over 40, this, is, this gestational age is actually earlier. Now that I've discussed timing of delivery, I'm going to discuss mode of delivery. A vaginal delivery is usually safest as it has lower blood loss, a faster recovery in general, decreased risk of blood clots, and less risk in subsequent pregnancies. 
However, a cesarean delivery is still extremely safe in the United States, and though it has a higher blood loss, an increased risk of infection and blood clots, and an increased risk of damage to surrounding organs, along with increased risks in the long term, like a morbidly inherent placenta and a future pregnancy, the benefits of C-section outweigh the risks in certain scenarios. Some indications for C-section include a baby being in a breech position, that is the baby's not head down. However, this baby may be a candidate for an external cephalic version, which is when a doctor turns the baby. You can ask your OBGYN if this is possible for you at 37 weeks. A baby that weighs more is that is expected to weigh more than 5,000 grams or 4,500 grams in, in a woman with diabetes uh, because of the risk of shoulder dystocia, which we'll discuss soon. Women who have a history of more than two cesarean deliveries or uterine surgery. An abnormal placenta location, such as a placenta previa or accreta. Or during labor, if the induction fails, the labor stops, or there is fetal distress, a C-section may be indicated. An operative delivery is when you are fully dilated and the baby's head is low, and there are reasons for the doctor to use a vacuum or a forceps to help expedite the delivery of the baby, either because the baby is showing signs of distress or the mother has a condition maybe with her heart or a neurologic condition that limits her ability to push. Generally, this is safer than a C-section at that point. One question I get asked a lot about is a TOLAC or a trial of labor after cesarean. In a future pregnancy after a cesarean delivery, you may be a candidate for a trial of labor if you're interested. Most large academic centers do to, uh, allow TOLACs. The biggest risk of a trial of labor after cesarean delivery is a uterine rupture, which is about less than 1% risk after a full term low transverse cesarean delivery. As a vaginal delivery, is, safer, is generally safer than the C-section. It decreases all the other risks we discussed earlier. However, if the trial is unsuccessful, the C-section becomes riskier than if the scheduled C-section was initially performed instead of attempting a TOLAC. And there are fetal risks to trial of labor as well, especially if the baby is in distress. Factors that affect the rate of success include a history of vaginal deliveries, age, Body, body mass index, and the reason for the previous C-section. If the reason is something that is not recurrent, like fetal distress, as opposed to arrest of labor, your TOLAC may be more likely to be successful. I'd like to also clear up some myths around delivery. Epidurals are a personal choice. They have not been shown to slow down labor, and they are totally up to you. Sometimes your medical team will recommend an epidural if the baby is in distress because this way, it is, this way you have appropriate anesthesia if you require an urgent delivery and it is safer for both you and your baby. We do not do routine episiotomies either. Make sure your support team works with and not against your medical team. Your support team is here to support you and your wishes during birth, whether it is your partner, your family member, or your doula. You want someone who is an advocate for you and is collaborative with your medical team in a respectful way. During your hospital admission, there are some common obstetrical risks, such as postpartum hemorrhage and shoulder dystocia. Postpartum hemorrhage affects 1 to 5% of women worldwide and accounts for 10% of maternal deaths globally. Some of the risk factors include body mass index, age, his having more than five deliveries, having a low blood count, an infection during labor, a twin delivery, having a larger baby, a quick labor, or a really long labor. This can happen in women with or without risk factors, which is why it's always important to have an IV when you're in the hospital for labor. Having a history of a postpartum hemorrhage is a big risk factor. So always let your doctor know because they'll, there are some tricks up their sleeves they can try to prevent this from happening and to boost up your blood count before delivery. A shoulder dystocia is when the baby's head is delivered, but the shoulder gets stuck. There is about a 10 to 20% risk of a neonatal brachial plexus injury, which can be transient or permanent for the baby. There is also an increased risk of postpartum hemorrhage and vaginal lacerations in this scenario. And the rates of this recurring are at least 
10%. If this happens to you, it's important to discuss this with your doctor and your future pregnancies, and you can discuss having a scheduled cesarean delivery in your next pregnancy with your doctor. I'd like to shift to postpartum care for now. This is often the hardest time for women when they need our support. Maternal mental health is so important and will be talked about in our December series. New recommendations by the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists recommend that every woman follow up within three weeks of delivery. The initial assessment should be following with ongoing care as needed, concluding with a comprehensive postpartum visit no later than 12 weeks after birth, and the timing of this comprehensive postpartum visit should be individualized and women-centered. Preeclampsia can also occur after birth, most commonly within the first three weeks, even if you've had no risk factors, so pay attention to the warning signs that we've discussed before. In the United States, cardiovascular disease is now the leading cause of death in pregnant women and women in the postpartum period, and therefore symptoms such as shortness of breath should be taken seriously and evaluated by your doctors. The uterus also needs time to heal. It is important to wait 18 months before attempting conception again, and so therefore contraception or birth control is quite important because the risks of short interval pregnancy such as preterm birth or uterine rupture are high. Postpartum is also a window into lifelong health for women. We screen after six weeks postpartum for conditions that occurred during pregnancy, such as diabetes or hypertension, because they may actually be due to underlying disease that was undetected before pregnancy. If these are still present at this time, you will be referred to a primary care doctor or a cardiologist. Additionally, Adverse outcomes in pregnancy can be a window into future maternal health. Women with just, who have had a history of diabetes in pregnancy need to be screened for diabetes every one to three years in the future. And women with either gestational hypertension or severe preeclampsia are more likely to develop hypertension or cardiovascular disease. And there is also new evidence associating preterm birth with future cardiovascular disease. Therefore- Women with pregnancies give you complicated by preterm birth, gestational diabetes, or hypertensive disorders of pregnancy should be counseled that these disorders are associated with a higher lifetime risk of maternal metabolic disease. These women should undergo regular cardiovascular risk assessment and be referred to a cardiologist. Thank you for listening and I look forward to your questions. All right, thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Strauss. Uh, next, I want to introduce our next speaker. We have Dr. Sahar Wertheimer. And uh, Dr. Wertheimer gave us a wonderful speech yesterday. Um, let's see. My screen just went blank. Okay, I can take it from here. Can you? Oh, wait, no, I just pulled it up. Uh, Dr. Wertheimer completed her OBGYN residency at Albert Einstein Montefiore Medical Center and is now finishing her subspecialty training in reproductive endocrinology and infertility in Los Angeles. She's also the chair of the Women's Health Initiative Committee and will be joining a private practice in LA next year. All right, thank you. Thank you. So um, for everybody, uh, just to recap, so reproductive endocrinology and infertility um, is uh, basically fertility medicine and the hormones re related to the reproductive tract. Um, so both me and the next speaker, Dr. Um, Maslow are both um, in that field. And so we're going to be addressing infertility and um, and some and a little bit about miscarriages and terminations. So I'm going to start with infertility, but Dr. Maslow is going to um, address treatment of infertility. So um, what I really wanted to go over today was um, for everyone to understand how pregnancy happens. And then once we understand how pregnancy happens, we can understand how infertility happens. You know, where do things go wrong and what, do, what can we evaluate um, to see where things are going wrong? 
So just some backgrounds here, and I put this little phrase up here um, that says that the phrase that just relax has a 0% pregnancy success rate, and yet a staggering 100% rate for really annoying someone. And um, the reason I put that up there is because I think we've all heard from our mothers if we don't get pregnant in one month to just relax, but um, that's not how you get pregnant. So we're gonna talk about it now. Infertility affects up to 15% of couples, so that's one in eight. Um, and the female factor, uh, meaning something that is going awry in the female reproductive system happens 30% of the time in couples with infertility. Male factor contributes to 30 to 40% of couples and sometimes can even be the only reason in about 20% of couples. And then unfortunately, there's about 30% of couples that no matter what we do and what evaluation um, we do, we're not gonna find anything. And that can be extremely frustrating though sometimes those patients do have a better prognosis because sometimes nothing's wrong and it's just they're on the wrong side of statistics. Um, okay, so to achieve pregnancy, and I apologize that this is kind of obvious to some people, but you would be surprised um, how unobvious it is to others. Um, basically, you need a few things. You need eggs, um, and eggs are uh, housed in follicles. Those are the uh, egg sacs on the ovary. And every month, a group of them comes to the forefront of the ovary and only one of them will be selected for ovulation. The rest of that pack that kind of came to the front of the ovary um, is reabsorbed into the body. So every cycle, you're not losing one egg, you're losing a little bit more than one egg. Um, and that's why your um, ovarian reserve can decrease um, from millions of sperm, from millions of eggs when you're born um, to uh, almost a thousand or so at menopause. And um, that's also why in IVF or in, uh, we can give you hormones to kind of rescue that whole cohort of eggs that comes to the forefront of the ovaries. And we're not decreasing your ovarian reserve more than um, you would have lost that cycle anyways. Um, so the egg is ovulated and we discussed that yesterday in our menstrual cycle um, lecture and it, it travels, it's, it's grasped by the fallopian tube and it travels um, into the tube where it is met by the sperm. The sperm is deposited in the female reproductive tract in the vagina. It travels through the cervix and um, meets the egg in the fallopian tube. Oops. Um, so uh, it should fertilize somewhere in the fallopian tube and then it travels down as it's dividing into an embryo and implants in the lining of the uterus. So you need egg, you need sperm, you need to ovulate the egg and to ovulate the egg, you need an intact hormonal axis. And we spoke about those hormones yesterday. Um, you need the fallopian tubes to be open and um, you need a uterus for the, um, for the uh, embryo to implant in. So if there is any um, issue at any one of these areas, um, and I have that here, um, then you can end up with infertility. So eggs, what can go wrong there? Um, you can have a decreased amount of eggs left. You that's that, and that's referring just to the quantity of eggs and not necessarily the quality, but you can also have a decreased um, quality of eggs. And we'll address that in just a second. You can also have decreased amounts of sperm. And that's male factor. They can either be, again, quality or quantity. Um, and the quality is the, how the sperm moves and how it looks. Um, then you can have issues with ovulation. Um, it, um, conditions like polycystic ovary syndrome um, may preclude you from ovulating and we'll discuss that. If the fallopian tubes are blocked for whatever reason um, and that prevents the egg and sperm from meeting, that could be a reason for infertility and that's of, often called tubal factor infertility. Um, and then you can have issues with your uterus. Um, sometimes polyps can prevent implantation. Polyps are um, outgrowths of the lining of the uterus. Um, sometimes fibroids, which are growths of the muscle of the uterus can prevent implantation. Scar tissue from previous surgeries or um, adenomyosis, which is when the lining of the uterus implants in the muscle of the uterus causing an inflammatory state. And um, also uh, other pelvic infl inflammatory conditions like endometriosis, which is when um, the lining of the uterus implants elsewhere in the pelvis, uh, those can all cause um, states where it is difficult to get an implantation. And then finally, we have unexplained, which whether um, we're just not there with the science yet or we're not picking it up with our tests, um, uh, we, have, we, we don't know why some people are not getting pregnant. 
So um, going back to eggs, a little bit of a close up on all these factors. Your eggs, like I said, you can either have a quantity issue or a quality issue or both. Um, quantity uh, is typically called diminished ovarian reserve or DOR is the diagnosis. And quantity goes down with age um, in everybody. This, um, as you can see here with the blue line, the, um, the quantity goes down, but it doesn't start to steeply go down until you're about 35 or 37 years old. And even then you're not falling off a cliff. So a lot of people think that if they're not pregnant by the time they're 35, then they're not going to get pregnant, but that's not true. It just could take a little bit longer. Um, and then you have some people who are going to have a decreased amount of eggs for their age group, even though they're not 35 yet. And that's a reason to get your fertility checked by your doctor. Um, quality can be decreased because of increased genetic abnormalities. And most commonly, this goes down with age as well. As you can see, the red line, right when your quantity starts to go down is also when the quality um, starts to go down or the abnormal eggs start to go up. And this has to do with um, how your, uh, um, this has to do with the age of the eggs most, most commonly. Then there can be issues with sperm. So I just put this little graph here to show everyone um, what the parameters of sperm counts are. Not that anyone needs to memorize any of this, but just to show you in a normal ejaculate, there can be uh, even 15 million sperm. So although we talk about male factor a lot, um, you really only need one good sperm to reach the egg. So a lot of times with male factor, we can be very hopeful. However, um, um, sometimes there is no sperm to be found at all in the ejaculate, and then uh, that might lead you down um, different paths. Sometimes um, the male might need surgery to try and extract sperm from higher up in the male reproductive tract. Also, um, sometimes it's not a sperm count issue, but it's a sperm function issue. The sperm is not moving well, or it's not shaped well. And I also put these numbers up here to show you normal morphology or shape of sperm. Um, it's considered normal if even 4% of the sperm is normal, which just goes to show you how inefficient um, sperm can be. And then to address ovulatory dysfunction, um, this is very common. It's found in 40% of women who present with infertility, the most common reason being polycystic ovary syndrome. Um, and that, um, um, polycystic ovary syndrome, and then there's also uh, hypothalamic amenorrhea and primary ovary insufficiency. There's also other problems with different axes of hormones in from your brain um, that have to do with the thyroid or prolactin. Um, and uh, the way that Dr. Maslow told me to explain this in the simplest, simplest terms is really that there is some sort of disconnect between the brain and the ovaries. And um, in polycystic ovary syndrome, that is because you have too many eggs most of the time, whereas in hypothalamic, I'm sorry, in primary ovarian insufficiency, that's because you have too little eggs. Hypothalamic amenorrhea um, sometimes happens because women have had a period of increased stress in their life cycle. So it could be anorexia, bulimia, too much exercising. Um, sometimes it's genetic and it has nothing to do with any of those factors. But if you've ever had a period of amen of no periods for a while because you were eating very little or um, or exercising too much, that might um, that might clue your doctor in to look for hypothalamic amenorrhea. The good news is that although the, um, the connection between the brain and the ovaries is not necessarily working in hypothalamic amenorrhea, the eggs are still present. They just need to be, um, we just need to help you ovulate them. The same goes with PCOS. We just need to help with the ovulation signal if, if you're a PCOS patient that is not ovulating. Um, unfortunately, with primary ovarian insufficiency, it really depends where on the spectrum you fall and um, how few eggs you have left and how much your body may or may not be responding to hormones. So anatomy is another reason why um, infertility happens. So again, if you're if the egg can't meet the sperm in the tube, that's a reason, um, or if the um, embryo cannot implant in the lining. So what I have here. Um, is just some pictures to show you some of the tests that we do. This one um, in the middle is called a hysterosalpingogram where a dye is injected into the uterine cavity. And um, as you can see on the X-ray below, whatever is black has filled up with dye showing us that it's patent. So if the dye um, comes out from the tubes and flows nicely into the pelvic cavity, we know your tubes are open. If the dye is stopped from aggressing into the cavity, then we think there may be a block. Sometimes um, you can have a spasm of the tube, which is just a temporary incidence of it being blocked, in which case 
your doctor may recommend you to do the test again. Then um, all the way on the, on the right or the patient left is the um, saline ultrasound. That, so saline is injected into the uterine cavity and what you're seeing here is a sideways view of the uterus. The first image I have is a normal cavity. There's nothing inside. So you can see the saline, the, the dark part fills up nice and smooth and you can see the cavity. Whereas in the bottom part, there's a little polyp um, which shows up as a little bit of a defect in the black space. And then there's other issues like endometriosis, which is very complex, really deserves its whole own other talk. But endometriosis, I put some pictures here just to show you. Um, this top left one is a normal uterus and fallopian tubes. This is what we see on laparoscopy when we're looking down into the pelvis from the abdomen. Um, this is the uterus, this is the fallopian tubes and the, uh, sorry, this is the fallopian tubes and these are the ligaments that hold the uterus up. Um, and sometimes with endometriosis, you can see these little imperfections um, or um, adhesive tissue or scar tissue, which can, um, which can happen and it really ranges from, um, it can be very non-severe to very severe. And then like we mentioned before, unexplained infertility affects 30% of couples. Um, sometimes this is because um, uh, nothing is wrong. Sometimes this is because we can't detect what's wrong. And, um, you know, a lot of research is currently being done in the field of infertility to try and um, find more explanations. And something, although it is very um, frustrating to have unexplained infertility because um, there's really nothing that you can troubleshoot, uh, IVF or actually ovulation induction and IVF have both been shown to improve um, outcomes for patients with unexplained infertility. And um, not only that, I would say that sometimes while we do the process of IVF, we get a closer look at the um, whole process, uh, at your whole reproductive tract. How do you respond to hormones? How do the eggs get fertilized? How do they implant? And sometimes we get an idea, although not an official diagnosis of what may be causing unexplained infertility. Um, and based on that, we can come up with a treatment plan which um, Dr. Maslow is gonna speak about um, in just a second. So when to see your doctor if you are not getting pregnant? If you're under 35, the recommended interval is 12 months um, of unprotected intercourse. Um, you know, if you wanted to see somebody sooner, I don't think a fertility doctor will ever turn you away because you came too soon. Um, but if you're, oh, the, this is really just to highlight that if you're over 35, you should be seeing your doctor after only six months, not waiting a full year. And um, ASRM recommends even sooner in women over 40, they don't really give a time. And that's because um, when you're over 40, I think every, every month matters to us. Um, importantly, if you have a known condition, if you have PCOS, if you know you have endometriosis, um, if you are struggling to have good, um, to have um, penetrative intercourse, um, if you haven't had periods in a while, you should not wait a full year, you shouldn't even wait six months, you should talk to your doctor and come up with a plan of when to start um, pursuing treatment. Um, so the evaluation that your doctor does, we look, we cannot test for quality of your eggs. We can only test for quantity. Your age will give us um, a general idea of the quality of your eggs. The quantity we can um, assess with your follicle stimulating hormone. If it's very elevated, that means your, um, your uh, reserve is a little bit low. And then we can also check with your anti-malarian hormone, which does not need to be tied to a certain day of your cycle, but can be checked at any point during your cycle. And this gives us a pretty good idea of your um, background ovarian reserve and how you'll respond to treatment. And we can also do a count of the um, follicles that have come to the forefront of the ovary with an ultrasound. And that also gives us an idea of where you lie. Um, to check your anatomy, we can do those two tests that I showed you before where we inject dye or saline into the uterus. If we need more than that, sometimes we'll um, get an MRI or even do a laparoscopy depending on your history. For male factor, it's just a semen analysis. There's really nothing, there's some other complicated tests beyond that, but we usually refer to a male urologist in those instances. And, um, and then if anything came up in your history with your doctor that clued them into a specific cause for your infertility, your doctor will add those tests to your basic infertility evaluation. So for example, if your doctor suspects that you have PCOS based on your symptoms, um, they might order some hormone levels, which um, we check in PCOS. Hey, Dr. Wertheimer, just uh, another minute left to wrap up. Perfect, because I am done. Great. All right. Thank you so much. All and, right. Uh, again, if anyone has questions, save them for the end, okay? 
So our next speaker is Dr. Bhatsheva Maslow, and uh, Dr. Maslow is a reproductive endocrinologist and infertility specialist at Extended Fertility and Premium Health Center. She also has a master's in clinical and translational research and is the director of research at Extended Fertility. Additionally, she serves as the director for medical education of North America uh, Yoetzet Halacha program and sits on the founding board of director at JOMA. So it is with great pleasure uh, to welcome Batsheva Maslow, Dr. Batsheva Maslow. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Sharon. Thank you everyone for joining us. Hold on, I'm gonna share my screen. Give me one moment. Uh, share, perfect. There we go. Okay, so this evening we're gonna talk, I'm gonna pick up where Dr. Wertheimer left off and talk about some of the treatment options available for infertility. And, uh, and we're gonna talk about early pregnancy loss. None of these topics are gonna to be comprehensive. There's so much to discuss in here. And I just wanna say, we're gonna to briefly touch upon it. And some of these topics we're gonna to hopefully address in future webinars as well. Uh, I have no financial disclosures, like we've been mentioning all night, these conversations are not going to substitute a conversation that's personal and individual with a medical or a halakhic authority. What I want to cover today is our treatment of infertility and really just cover the basics of ovulation induction or timed intercourse, uh, IUI, intrauterine insemination, and IVF in vitro fertilization. And we'll briefly touch upon the idea of third-party reproduction as well. And then we'll switch gears a little bit to talk about early pregnancy loss, miscarriage and ectopic pregnancy, uh, recurrent pregnancy loss with someone who's having multiple pregnancies, and very briefly talk about termination of pregnancy. Treatment of infertility. So really our basic first line treatment of infertility uh, is something called ovulation induction. This is where we attempt to really restore function and perfect the timing of the cycle. So like uh, Dr. Wertheimer was mentioning, if there's uh, issues with the communication between the brain and the ovary, some of these medications are gonna help reinforce that and help prevent, uh, really help produce more function into the cycle. Um, these treatments, as you might imagine, are best used for people who have some form of ovulatory dysfunction. Um, and it may also be helpful for something called halachic infertility. So for those of you who may be familiar, uh, uh, when somebody is observing the halachos of nida and are waiting till, uh, let's say, day 12 or 13 or 14 to go to the mikvah to then be together with their, their husband, if somebody's ovulating prior to going to the mikvah, they may be consistently missing their, their um, window of window of ovulation and their opportunity to fertility. And I put halachic infertility in quotation marks because often short cycles or halachic, what lead to halachic infertility can be sort of the canary in the coal mine or a little bit of a hint to other issues going on. So a very short cycle that leads to halachic infertility might actually really be worth investigating uh, with a physician beyond just the actual halachic issues. Um, once you've gone beyond the stage of using medications to help regulate the cycle, there's additional things we can do to try to increase the chances of success with each individual cycle. Uh, this is something called an intrauterine insemination or an IUI. This is where we can take a sample of semen that's produced by the male partner uh, on the, you know, around the morning of ovulation. We concentrate it down so you have a high concentration of sperm in a very small volume. Uh, and you take that and you use a catheter uh, to try to uh, bring the sperm as close as you possibly can to the, um, to the egg. Now, I love this uh, infographic because it really gives you an idea of what we're looking at here. Here, the, you can see the egg being released by the ovary and the tube picked up by the tube and the sperm kind of racing to go get to it. Uh, when we do IUI, what we're able to do is overcome a few things. If there's an issue with the cervix, so the sperm is not able to really trans, you know, uh, swim through the cervix. If there's a small number of sperm or um, there's an issue with the quality or the morphology of the sperm, this can help overcome some of that as well. Uh, sometimes there are issues in terms of having adequate intercourse, uh, and sometimes IUI may be an appropriate step for that. Not always, but sometimes. 
The IUI can be paired with a natural cycle, which doesn't really give much additional um, chances of success beyond doing nothing. So it comes to about a five to 8% chance. When we pair it with medications such as Clomid or Letrozole, which are oral medications to help regulate the menstrual cycle, you get to somewhere about an eight to 10% chance of success per cycle with usually typically a less than 10% chance of twins. Um, the last opportunity within this sort of um, IUI framework is something called injectable gonadotropins. Gonadotropins are injectable hormones. They're identical to the hormones that your brain is using to regulate the menstrual cycle. So Clomid and Letrozole work by tricking the brain into thinking that they need to, it needs to send a stronger message to the ovary. The injectable medications actually directly stimulate the ovary. Uh, and so sometimes they provide additional chances for success because they increase the number of eggs that are being released or they bypass a dysfunctional brain ovary uh, conversation. Uh, they do come with an increased chance of twins or triplets. Now these numbers, I took these from a publication, but with really good monitoring and good, um, you know, a good physician care, these numbers are actually gonna be drastically lower than that. When IUI is either not an option or there are other reasons uh, that it may have not worked, um, the next step in our treatment is in, in vitro fertilization. Now in vitro fertilization is a big deal. It's, a, it's very expensive, it's very invasive, but it's also extraordinarily successful. We're talking about success rates, you know, anywhere from 40 to 75% of uh, um, cycles being successful, depending on where you go and who you are and what your sort of makeup of your, your case is. Uh, so it, while it does require a lot of injections and, you know, all of this really intimidating looking picture on the right, I mean, on the left, uh, it does lead to, to success and ultimately, hopefully the kind of happy pictures you see here on the right. Uh, IVF or in vitro fertilization requires several steps. So the first step is what we call controlled ovarian hyperstimulation. That's the medication that we give in order to tell the ovary to produce more than just one egg each month. So Dr. Wertheimer mentioned every month, there's gonna be a group of eggs that comes to the surface of the ovary that are gonna be available for pregnancy. In a natural cycle, your body is gonna just select one of these eggs to grow and the rest of them are essentially discarded. Uh, when we use these medications and we're using the same injectable gonadotropins that I mentioned before, you use these medications to directly stimulate the ovary and try to capture and grow and mature as many of these available follicles or eggs as possible. So what you're actually capturing are the group of eggs that you otherwise wouldn't have um, had access to, that you otherwise wouldn't have been able to. And that's why women who do IVF, and tomorrow we're going to talk about egg freezing, and women who do egg freezing, it doesn't affect their future fertility in any way. We're not stealing from future eggs. We're really utilizing these eggs that you otherwise wouldn't have been uh, had access to. Once the eggs are ready, we remove them from your body in a very minor procedure called an egg retrieval. It's done with a transvaginal ultrasound through the vaginal wall into the ovary. Uh, it's done under anesthesia typically. It takes about 15 minutes to do. There's no incisions. There's no stitches. Most people feel ready to go back to their regular life. I used to say ready to go back to work, but nobody really goes to work these days, except for maybe the doctors on this call. Um, but you're pretty much ready to bounce back by the next morning. Then starts the hard work in the lab. So the, the, embryo, the eggs need to be fertilized, the embryos get cultured, and then we can do some additional kind of fancy testing on these embryos as well. So the egg retrieval, like I mentioned, uh, starts with the stimulation. One, this is a picture of an ovary to the right here that's been fully stimulated. So you can see uh, an unstimulated ovary tends to have little small black circles. And these are big ones, plump ones. And what we do is put a needle into these ovary, into these follicles and draw out the fluid. Uh, and uh, that fluid gets sent to the laboratory and we look at it under a microscope. And this is what the fluid looks like. When we look at it under a microscope, we can find eggs. The egg is a single cell. It's the largest single cell in the human body. Uh, and these eggs are what we start with when we, uh, when we start the fertilization process. The fertilization process can be done either by just putting a droplet of semen with millions of sperm or thousands of sperm near the egg and kind of letting them do their thing naturally. Or we can use something called ICSI or intracytoplasmic sperm injection where we take a single sperm and directly inject it into each egg. So we really can maximize the chances that each egg are gonna can be fertilized. Then the egg has to develop. Okay, so this is really cool and I'm hoping it will work. Let's see. 
So this is a video of embryo uh, culture. The embryo starts as an egg and then it has to divide into from one cell to two cells, then from two cells to four cells. Uh, and the next cell division is gonna be from four cells to eight cells. This takes about three days in the laboratory. Uh, over time, over the next few days, it will divide into many cells and ultimately it's going to get to a phase called the blastocysts, which you're going to see in a moment. At this stage, you have an outer layer and an inner layer. The outer layer becomes the placenta. The inner layer is what ultimately becomes the fetus. And what allows us to test the chromosomes or, te of the, or the genes of these um, embryos is the fact that we now have hundreds of cells. So an egg starts off as a single cell, uh, which you can't test, but the embryo in its final embryo stage, you can biopsy, and that's what you see here. They're selecting a few cells off the surface of the embryo, and you can test the chromosomes and the DNA uh, of that individual embryo. Now, not every egg is going to fertilize. Not every fertilized egg is going to make it all the way to this final embryo stage. So there's a lot of wastage and a lot of loss along the way. But when you make it to this final stage, these embryos have a very high chance of success, especially if you're able to test them. So someone asked earlier in the question, in, in the questions, in the Q&A, can embryos be tested for Down syndrome? So you can select a few of these cells and uh, and sequence and look at their chromosomes. And what you're able to look at is how many chromosomes are in, uh, are in these eggs. And as Dr. Wertheimer mentioned, as we get older, the eggs start to develop uh, abnormalities in the chromosomes. They have either too many or too few chromosomes, and that gets transmitted to the embryos. So what we start to see is a decline in pregnancy rates because those embryos tend to just not work if they're abnormal. So with IVF, if you've generated many, many embryos, you may not know which ones have the right number of chromosomes and which ones have the wrong number of chromosomes, but you can use what we call now pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy. So aneuploidy is a fancy word for having not the right number of chromosomes. Uh, and we call that PGTA. And that's becoming extraordinarily popular because it really increases the chances of getting pregnant with the first embryo transfer. Uh, and it decreases the chances of miscarriage because the really the most common reason for miscarriage is an abnormal chromosome. You can also use this to test for single gene mutations. So if you know, just like we mentioned yesterday, when we we're talking about gene mutations, if you were to know that both parents were carriers of a particular gene, you could then search the embryo genome for that particular gene. Now it's not, you can't search for every gene, you have to know what specifically which gene you're looking for. What are IVF success rates like? Ultimately, IVF success rates, like I mentioned, are extraordinarily more uh, higher than any of the, anything else that we have in our, in our toolbox. Now, that doesn't mean they're necessarily the right thing for every single person, uh, but it is certainly much more successful. And really the biggest determining factor of IVF success is gonna be the age, the female age, because of these uh, accumulation of abnormalities uh, in the eggs. And this sets the stage for what we're gonna talk about tomorrow in terms of why egg freezing can be useful uh, because it allows you to utilize younger eggs in, at an older age. For those who are unable to conceive with their own eggs or their own sperm, either because there are no more eggs or there are no more normal eggs or the partner, the male partner doesn't have sperm or the sperm is not available, we start, or there isn't a uterus, right? So you need three things, an embryo, you need an egg, a sperm and a uterus. If one of those three things is, is not working for the couple, there can be a third person or a third party that can, that can provide the necessary equipment or the necessary piece for this, for this baby to, to be born. Um, so third party reproduction encompasses donor sperm, getting sperm from another man, donor eggs, getting egg from another woman, um, and a gestational carrier, having somebody else carry a, a embryo that's genetically from the two intended parents. There's a lot of complexities here, both ethically, socially, religiously, uh, that are more than we can really discuss tonight. Now, I'm gonna just very briefly touch upon pregnancy loss. Um, pregnancy loss is extraordinarily common. Uh, it's 50 to 20% of all known pregnancies and up to 50% of women may experience pregnancy loss at some point during their life almost all of them will go on to have a normal pregnancy in their next pregnancy. So it's not necessarily something that's gonna set you up 
uh, for, for pregnancy loss in the future. The vast majority of pregnancy loss is, ca is caused by chromosomal abnormalities in the fetus. So it's nothing that was done, meaning as a person who, who suffers a miscarriage, you really can reassure yourself that there wasn't something that you did that caused the miscarriage or something that you didn't do that could have saved it. These are typically destined pregnancies before they even started. Most women will pass their pregnancies on their own um, if given the time, but many will prefer to have some kind of in surgical or medical intervention. We used to recommend that you'd have to wait after a miscarriage to try to conceive again. And truthfully, there really is, has been a lot of evidence to show that that's not necessary. Ectopic pregnancy is a very special kind of pregnancy loss, so it's also not a viable pregnancy. It's a pregnancy that happens in the tube rather than in the uterus, and it's potentially life-threatening to the, to the woman because the tube, as you can see in this bottom picture, is not really intended to carry a pregnancy and can burst and can cause uh, internal bleeding, which you can start to see in this picture, uh, and really needs to be taken care of either medically or surgically. Last but not least, um, recurrent pregnancy loss. Recurrent pregnancy loss is a really special um, and difficult diagnosis for couples. So this is somebody who, a couple who's experiencing multiple pregnancy um, losses. Uh, and sometimes this happens as a result of a predisposition to a chromosomal abnormality, something called a balanced translocation or a structural problem in the uterus that's not allowing the pregnancy to progress or sometimes there is a hematologic or an immunologic immune system issue. Um, but the vast majority of couples who are experiencing infertility, um, sorry, recurrent pregnancy loss will fall into this category of unexplained. There really isn't a reason or that we can find for their losses. Um, and even with that, uh, the evidence, what you can see on the right here, shows that with recurrent attempts, with continued attempts at pregnancy, the chances of success are very high. Now, that's often very emotionally difficult for, for couples to keep trying and keep having losses. And sometimes they think about doing IVF with PGT, like we mentioned, uh, but there's not a lot of evidence and it's really a very individual case by case basis. So it's something that's really worth having a strong conversation with a physician about. Uh, and I'll put in a plug for a, a book of a friend of mine wrote called Not Broken, uh, which really helps uh, couples who are struggling with infertility, I'm struck, sorry, struggling with recurrent pregnancy loss, come to grips with the fact that there isn't something that they've done or, or that there's something, you know, broken about them um, and kind of bring down the data and the evidence about what's best and how can how to move forward. To close out the evening, I want to just briefly touch upon termination of pregnancy. There are many, many reasons why someone might think about terminating a pregnancy, no matter what community they come from, no matter what kind of relationship they're in. Um, and the bottom line is that the earlier in pregnancy this is done, the less complicated physically and emotionally it is for the patient, and the more options she may have about where the termination can happen and how. Um, these are really deeply sensitive and emotional issues that anyone who's thinking about having a termination for My any to the bathroom um, pregnant. are grappling with. Uh, and so one of the reasons I put it out here is for us to really uh, approach it with sensitivity uh, and the complexity that, that it deserves. Uh, I'm going to stop here with a, a little bit of a sort of tongue-in-cheek joke about what not to say uh, to women who may be suffering from infertility or pregnancy loss. Uh, Dr. Wertheimer touched upon some of these uh, as well. And, um, and then thank you all for, for coming to our event. I think Dr. Wertheimer will, will wrap things up. Yeah, um, so I just wanted to, uh, oh, um, I just want, can you put those slides back yeah, up so we can coming, show sorry. Okay. I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for coming out and listening to us, um, to the whole JOMA board, to everybody who spoke today, um, and to our moderators, Dr. Stoll and Dr. Um, Helman and Ostrov, and um, to all, all our um, sponsors, including um, Dr. Halpern from Turo College, New York Medical College, uh, J Screen, Extend Fertility, Sherman Abrams Labs, and Jewish Fertility Foundation. Um, they're all uh, partners with us in women's health and um, not just sponsors of this one event. Um, uh, and if you can advance the slide. Um, um, 
JOMA is a nonprofit organization. All of this was volunteer work. And um, if you want to help us continue improving women's health awareness, you can donate at this link. Um, we're hoping to do continued specialized series every month where we kind of zero in on a topic. Um, as you guys saw, there's a lot to cover and um, this doesn't do it justice. We just wanted to give a general overview. Um, tomorrow night, we're gonna talk about um, some non, some. Technically all of uh, OBGYN is reproductive, but some less reproductive topics um, tomorrow, abnormal uterine bleeding, um, egg freezing and pelvic pain. And we're gonna zero in on some contraceptive methods. So be sure to come tomorrow. Um, and then we have a mental health um, and reproduction in December. And with that, I will uh, give it back to Dr. Stoll to moderate our Q&A. Oh, great, thank you. And uh, again, thank you so much, everyone, for the phenomenal lectures. Uh, I know I learned a lot today. Um, so I'm going to uh, just address some of these questions. Um, uh, so this is either for Dr. Wertheimer or, or Dr. Maslow. Um, if you could touch a little bit more, I know we're going to speak about it tomorrow as well, but um, uh, just how long is a normal menstrual cycle and with Nita halachic infertility? Sure. I, I mean, I'll take that in uh, if you don't mind. So a quote unquote normal menstrual cycle can be anywhere from 24 days to 35, 36 days, especially if somebody is regularly having that. So somebody who has a 25 or 26 day cycle regularly, that may not necessarily be medically abnormal. Uh, the problem is, or the, typically what happens is the variation from cycle to cycle actually happens in the first half of the cycle. So in the beginning of the menstrual cycle, the brain is telling the ovary to grow the egg. And then at some point the egg is ready to be released. Once the egg is released, there's typically about 14 days uh, from that time of ovulation until the next period begins. Um, and so the variation in cycle is often for that first part and the 14 days kind of stays um, stay still. So for example, somebody who is, has a 35 day cycle, they're actually ovulating very late. They're probably ovulating on day like 21. Um, so we typically talk about people ovulating on day 14, because that's like the classic 28 day cycle, but many people don't have classic 28 day cycles. And if you have a 25 or 26 day cycle, you may be ovulating on day 12 or day 11. And if you're going to the mikvah, many women aren't getting to the mikvah earlier than day 12. Um, and so you may be consistently ovulating prior to the mikvah. So there are small, you know, there's a small group of women for whom this is happening. Um, where there isn't really a, any other medical issue going on other than the fact that they are regularly ovulating prior to the mikvah. And there are some actual like very low intensity interventions we can do to try to slow down and, and, um, and delay ovulation until after the mikvah, usually like a um, taking an estrogen pill, which is really estrogen is a natural hormone that the body produces regularly during the menstrual cycle. So that helps slow down the, the, um, the cycle, but like I mentioned, it could also be a warning sign of, of other issues that may be going on. Great, thanks. Uh, another question that came up a few times tonight and also yesterday was, if you're a um, single female who isn't um, sexually active, uh, at what age is it recommended to start seeing a gynecologist? Um, yeah, we did address that yesterday. Um, so um, uh, ACOG's recommendation is around age 13 to 15 to see your gynecologist just to get like a general lay of the land um, orientation. Um, but if you are not sexually active, then I would say um, probably by age 21 when your pap smear is due, um, unless you have an issue, you can see your gynecologist sooner. Okay, great. Thanks. And then also another question that came up a few times, um, and I think it was also addressed, but I figured we, we should just answer it for everyone. Um, if you're a single woman and um, want to reserve eggs because you're hoping, Amir Sashem, you're gonna get married soon, but uh, because of that, that um, egg reserve decreases with age, what's the best time or the best age to start thinking about 
reserving eggs or freezing. So eggs. I'll just, I'll just pop in and say, that's like half our conversation tomorrow night. So join okay. us tomorrow night and we're going to touch upon all of those things. Perfect. Okay. Um, there was a question I saw in the chat about biochemical pregnancies, which I thought um, I get a lot of questions on in general. I don't know if Dr. Um, Aslo wants to address. People mm -hmm. just want to know a little bit more about biochemical pregnancies. Sure. So biochemical pregnancies are what we call, you know, somebody who has a positive pregnancy test and then the positive and then the pregnancy test is negative. They are much more common now than they've ever been because pregnancy tests are so much more sensitive now than they've ever been, but they've probably been happening all along and people just kind of saw that as a weird late period. Um, we still think that biochemical pregnancies uh, generally happen as a result of abnormalities uh, directly within the fetus itself. Uh, and again, so these are generally things that are sort of destined to happen, whether you would have done something or not done something or knew you were pregnant or didn't know you were pregnant. Um, and they can be relatively common. Uh, somebody who's having recurrent biochemical pregnancies, even though that's common and, you know, they didn't, we didn't used to really know about that they existed, recurrent biochemical pregnancies is still something that's really worth uh, working up. And, and I've just, I've found, you know, things that are important to find in women who have been couples who have had recurrent biochemical losses. So I still very much clinically consider it a loss. Um, and it's certainly worth investigating if it's something that's happening more frequently. Okay, great. And uh, I'm just going through some of these. Did any of the other um, panelists see any questions that kept coming up over and over again? Yeah, it seems the question about how do you know if you're ovulating keeps coming up. I was just about um, to answer that one in the in the. I saw that too. I answered it yesterday. Okay, so, and this also came up, I, I saw somebody asked a question, if you have PCOS with irregular cycles, how do you know when to check a pregnancy test? These, these are both kind of related. So um, to know how, if you're ovulating, you can use um, ovulation predictor kits. It's basically a stick that you pee on that lets you know you are having the LH surge that we spoke about yesterday. Um, the LH surge is a hormone um, which goes up right before you ovulate. So you can use those to predict. Unfortunately, in women with PCOS, sometimes those hormones are always high. And so um, ovulation predictor kits are not very accurate. Um, and so uh, in that subset of women, the only way to really know is by monitoring you with an ultrasound. Um, or you can come see your local REI and we can help you ovulate and then we'll know exactly when you ovulated. Um, I hope that addresses the question. I don't know if Dr. Maslow has anything to add. No, I think the only thing I would add is that um, there are many women, if they really pay attention, can sometimes identify physical symptoms that they consistently experience during ovulation. So some people may have like breast tenderness, vaginal discharge, or something called middle schmerz, which is one of my favorite medical terms, um, but is like a crampy sensation around ovulation. Um, it's sometimes difficult and many women don't experience it, but some, if they really pay attention, will. Uh, there's some old sort of old fashioned ways using um, temperature, like basal body temperature. They're actually very effective. Um, you really do see a shift in temperature, um, but it's just hard to take your temperature every single morning at exactly the same time. There are some newer technologies that use um, like wearables. So there's some, there are bracelets and there are special thermometers and Fitbits and all these things that can actually use your heart rate and your skin uh, perfusion and a variety of other um, bio, like biofeedback markers to actually quite reliably predict when you're ovulating. Um, so if that's something, you know, that's, that's like a new kind of big data technology way of, of looking at cycles as well. Um, so uh, I'm looking at a question now that I'm sure a lot of people are thinking in the back of their heads. Um, this is, uh, how does a gender and a baby become? Depends on what? Uh, Just typing the answer. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, um, I, uh, I, I love learning about the, um, the different hormonal responses depending on the genetics of the chromosomes. But if you could just talk about um, the basics 
yeah. uh, that it doesn't depend on, uh, you know, how fa fast the sperm sweat, or maybe it does, if you could answer that. I yeah. Guess. So to just take it really simple back to the basics for anyone who like remembers back to like or high school biology about meiosis and mitosis, in order for eggs and sperm to be made, the chromosomes have to be split. So a healthy human is gonna have 46 chromosomes and either two X chromosomes that'll make them female or uh, X and a Y chromosome will make them male. Um, this, the egg and sperm have to each contain 23 chromosomes. So the chromosomes split. Um, when women make eggs, each of their chromosome, each of their eggs will have a 23 X. So it has half. Uh, and then the sperm are going to have 23 chromosomes as well, so that when they come together, they are going to have 46 chromosomes. The sperm are going to have, half of them are going to have 23X and half will be 23Y. So what determines the baby's gender is really which sperm fertilizes the egg, because the egg's always going to have an X chromosome. So if it's an X chromosome sperm that fertilizes the egg, and that's going to be a female uh, baby because there, it has two X chromosomes. And if it's a Y chromosome uh, sperm, it will, uh, it will be a, a male. So because it'll have an X and a Y. There have been lots and lots and lots of um, bubbies and doctors and all sorts of people who have been trying to figure out, is there a way to, you know, favor one gender over the other? Is there a position you can take during intercourse or maybe the X chromosome? Like coffee. Right, the X chromosome sperm is heavier because the X chromosome is bigger than the Y chromosome. Can you shift it in some way? Generally, these have not been successful beyond just a coin toss, which is essentially what you get. It's 50-50, either it's gonna be X or Y. Um, the, really the only way to select a gender is to do IVF like we described with PGT where you identify the chromosomes and you also get to learn the gender uh, and then select the desired gender. Now it doesn't always work that way and you can't edit the chromosome. So we can't make it female if that's what you want and, and you only have males. Uh, but right now, that's the only reliable way to select a particular gender. Uh, shameless plug here to follow your doctors on social media, because <laughs> I literally addressed this not long ago. And all the people here, I believe, have uh, social media accounts where they're putting out good educational info. Great. Here's another one, because we have a few minutes left. Um, a topic pregnancy at what point, how many weeks does it become life threatening? Um, so, uh, oh, you go, go ahead, Tirza. So, um, an ectopic pregnancy always has the risk of being life threatening. Um, the risk with the ectopic pregnancy is that, you know, when the pregnancy is in, implanted in your uterus where it's supposed to be, the pregnancy grows and the uterus grows with the pregnancy. But if the pregnancy is ectopic, which means implanted outside the uterus, the other structures in your abdomen can't grow and can burst and fill your belly with blood. So you may have an ectopic pregnancy and this may or may not happen, but that's always the risk. And it may happen spontaneously or randomly with, without any um, warning. And that's why it's never going to turn into a live pregnancy with a baby. Um, and it can, and it used to be one of the common causes of maternal death in the first trimester before we were able to diagnose it with ultrasound. Great. And then here's another good one. I actually was following, uh, I think, Physician Mom Group that was talking about this. Um, so pregnancy during COVID, uh, I'm not, I'm going to paraphrase this question and change it a little bit. But if someone is, I, I don't know if everyone here has been following along, but um, increased risk of uh, clots during COVID if you're pregnant in the first, second, or, or the first or second trimester. Um, has any, any thoughts to that? So what a great question. I think, you know, COVID is really the hot topic these days. Um, and I, 
It's interesting that you brought up blood clots. We know that women in pregnancy are more at risk for blood clots. You know, in pregnancy, your body is gearing up to the moment of delivery, which is one of the bloodiest moments compared to almost any other surgery. So your body accrues all these clotting factors to prepare for this, which is why pregnant women are more at risk for clots, and especially in the postpartum period, the first six weeks postpartum, and COVID also puts you at risk for clots. So there haven't really been any specific studies as far as I know, and there are new studies coming out every day specifically regarding pregnancy and COVID and clots. But I do want to mention that um, the newer data that just came out from the CDC, um, which um, compiles all the statistics of pregnant women with COVID is showing that pregnant women are more at risk of other effects of COVID. They're more likely to go to the hospital. They are more likely to um, require respiratory support. Some of the earlier studies that actually came out of New York City, which was the, you know, the hotspot last year, shows that one in, uh, one in five women were like um, had severe disease and were um, within that um, when we were um, more likely to require ICU care. Um, we can also use this as a shameless plug for the flu shot because we have a vaccination for something else that women are more at risk than clots um, and something to help prevent that. So very, very important to get your flu shot. Great, thanks. Okay, uh, we have two and a half minutes left. Are there any questions that any of the panelists see that they would like to answer or address? Yeah, I see this question coming up a lot. How long does it take to resume normal menses after stopping birth control? I'm gonna give it to Dr. Maslow. You literally get me just as I'm typing every answer. <laughs> so this is a great, great question. And one of the things that highlights that everybody's different and everybody responds to medications differently and stopping those medications differently. Um, it also highlights the fact that menstrual abnormalities are extraordinarily common. Uh, and being on birth control pills can sometimes mask some of those menstrual abnormalities. So the first thing to say is that you absolutely can get pregnant in the month immediately following birth control, right? So somebody, if you're going off your birth control pills, recognize that you are at risk for pregnancy and that's something that you want or desire or are ready to accept should you get pregnant the next month. Now it's by no means a guarantee that you will get pregnant the next month. The natural pregnancy rate, even under the most perfect circumstances, is only about 15% per month. And it can take some women a few months to get kind of back to a regular menstrual cycle routine following the birth control pills. I typically say if after three months off the birth control pills, you are still not having a regular cycle, then that's something to address with a physician. Uh, it could be that you have some kind of menstrual abnormality that the birth control pills was kind of masking because the birth control pills take over your cycle and kind of tell your uterus when to bleed and when not to bleed uh, and don't really uh, give your brain and the ovary a chance to have that communication. So if there is some kind of ovulatory dysfunction, you won't see it while you're on the birth control pills. But I would give it at least one to three months to see what happens before, before you, you, know, you go exploring that any further. All right, great. Well, that about wraps it up for tonight. Thank you again uh, to all of our speakers and um, physicians that are listening in that are fielding these questions. Again, uh, all of the answers provided tonight, I see that there were 116 questions answered. We're all done by physicians as a part of JOMA. Um, thank you for all of the support. And uh, I hope everyone joins us again tomorrow night. Thank you, right. everyone. Have a good evening. Bye.